Hello everyone, Merman Jax here, and thank you for coming to check out some of the ongoing digital content for the California Mermaid Convention's online event this year. I will be doing a micro lecture here on water horses, the hippocampus, and the kelpie. Now some of you may know I have adopted a cute little hippocampus named Nico, and this whole lecture was inspired by him, as I often get a lot of questions about what kind of creature he is, and where he came from and things like that. And I realized from a merman's point of view that a lot of humans may not know much about water horses, so I wanted to take that time here to chat and just dip our toes into the world of these beautiful creatures. I wanted to take opportunities to specifically discuss in this lecture the difference between the hippocampus and the kelpie, as these are often the two most confused water horse type creatures. There are other creatures we'll touch on, such as the knock and the water horse itself, the Loch Ness Monster kind of thing. These are all related, but I'm primarily going to be focusing on the hippocampus and the kelpie. Now, I don't have any formal degree in mythology or folklore. It is a huge personal passion project of mine my entire life. I do have a certification in cryptozoology, which gave me some insight into the water horse in regards to the Loch Ness Monster, which we'll get into. Speaking in the most traditional sense of this whole lecture, I'm going to use a lot of generalizations and even stick to keywords because this is a micro lecture and we don't have time to get into everything right now. Also, disclaimer, there may be some semi-adult topics here in terms of history mythology, just so people know, but I think it's time to jump right in and get more in depth with these amazing creatures. Now, water horses in general are to be disrespected at your own risk. Neither of these creatures we'll be discussing are inherently evil, though the Kelpie does have more of a darker energy than, say, its cousin, the Hippocampus. Uh, much like a lion hunting in its own environment, you would consider a lion evil for hunting and feeding, so I want to make sure we don't demonize any of these creatures and respect them and realize that they have an important impact on our biological system. So the first thing I want to talk about is the movie The Water Horse, which obviously has the lecture title in its own title. Now I won't be talking too much about this creature, as it does tend to feel like more of the Loch Ness variety, which has more of a dinosaur, plesiosaurus appearance. In this lecture, I want to try to focus on water creatures that have more of an inherently visual horse aspect. Although in some circles, the water horse of the Loch Ness, Nessie, is considered to be the largest kelpie in the world. So that's for you to decide. I haven't met her yet, but some people do consider her a kelpie. Another creature I want to lightly touch on is the Nock from Frozen 2, the beautiful water elemental spirit that took the form of horse in that movie. Generally, the knock can shape shift and can sometimes appear in a horse form. More often than not, it does appear in a human form, so I won't touch on that specific creature too much. And also, that was a very intense, powerful creature, but it wasn't evil. It was about nature and the elements being out of balance. And it is one of the creatures that falls under the water horse categories. Another general question that people sometimes ask me about is, even if you are semi-familiar with water horses, you may wonder how do they interact with merfolk? We hear the stories and legends and myths, we see the art of these creatures from a human point of view, but from a merfolk point of view, it is a little different. Uh, Hippocampi are obviously very amicable and offer in the company of lots of sea creatures, including merfolk, and they seem to be a very friendly, open, experiencing creature with merfolk. The Kelpie, there's not a lot of historical data with how Kelpies interact with merfolk. In my experience, the ones I know have been just as amicable with merfolk as the hippocampus is. But there may also just be a thing that Kelpies are slightly more solitary, so that it may interact with other creatures less in general. We will now start discussing the hippocampus. Though Mediterranean in origin, the actual etymology of the name is very specifically Greek and pretty literally translates into horse sea monster. It doesn't get more literal than that. The hippocampus actually appeared in art as early as the 4th century 
BC. So in terms of visual appearance, the hippocamp is often seen and portrayed as essentially a normal sized horse with the lower half of a fish. Now there are varying degrees of other appearances upon visual sightings and in art. Um, sometimes they have finned hooves, sometimes they have a finned mane opposed to hair, sometimes they're blue or green colored. It can really vary. There are tons of hippocampi species out there and I don't think we even know um, most of them. Sometimes even the hippocampus is shown with wings. This seems to be largely based on artistic interpretation versus the way the creature actually looks. In a way also that differentiates the hippocampus from the kelpie is that the hippocampus is not a shapeshifter and it does hold its form. Some ancient cultures actually believe that the tiny cute little seahorses that we know, and some can get bigger, it was believed these were just juvenile hippocampus that would eventually grow into their very big life-size counterparts. Hippocampus in general are considered more on the good or at least neutral side of demeanor. They're very, very similar to the horses we know in general, and they are very locally based in salt water. It doesn't mean the species can't go into fresh water and back and forth, same with the Kelpie. Traditionally, the hippocampus is identified as a very ocean sea creature. If you want to know where the hippocampus first came from or who it was created by, most legends point to the god of the sea Poseidon. And I will reference some Greco-Roman mythology here and just keep things simple. I'm going to stick with using the term Poseidon. Now Poseidon uh, became very attracted and tried to woo the goddess Demeter, the goddess of grain and agriculture. The goddess cleverly asked Poseidon to create her the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. He went to hard at work and started working on an animal to create for her, to impress her and woo her. And along this path, he created the hippo, the camel, the giraffe, eventually landing on the horse as one of his big, sacred, beautiful creatures. The hippocampus was assumed to be created along the way as well. And the hippocampus became so beloved to him, he actually had them pull his chariot through the waves. In terms of diet, Hippocampi are omnivores. They do eat lots of seaweeds and algae, things like that. I know Nico, who's sleeping right now, he loves seaweed. He loves fresh seaweed, dried seaweed, but he also eats small little fish, maybe small crabs. He is omnivorous. He also isn't above stealing a sour gummy candy from me when I'm not paying close enough attention. So there's a quick little overview of the amazing hippocampus. And now we're gonna move on to the Kelpie, or as Mermaid Rachel and myself like to affectionately call them, murder ponies. If you don't know why, you will find out. Um, the actual etymology of the word Kelpie is unclear. It is a Scots word, and it's believed it is linked to the Gaelic word Kelpa, which means colt. Now these are definitely Scottish-based creatures, though in general they are seen throughout the Celtic world as a whole. Now these are shape-shifting water creatures, so they are supernatural in context, and they're almost always freshwater based. That means rivers, lakes, streams, swamps, sometimes even fjords, things like that, but they're generally considered freshwater creatures. They most often appear as a beautiful black horse, but can also take on the appearance of a human. And most Kelpie sightings in human form are male, and in art, a lot of Kelpies are female, interestingly enough. Now, in terms of art specifically, the Kelpie is often shown as an eerie horse in sometimes traditional colors, but sometimes in a supernaturally dark color or watery hues, soaking wet with a beautifully long mane and tail, usually just covered in beautiful reeds and freshwater plants and things like that. Um, but it does have a dangerous energy around them a dangerous and seductive energy because the point of a Kelpie is to get someone to ride them. Uh, sometimes even some humans have said that Kelpie can be absolutely terrifying once you're on the horse. They can even be demonic looking and they can have red eyes or even like a decaying horse skull as a face. I'm not sure if that's true. Humans tend to overreact. Well, forgive them. These are new creatures to them. But sometimes they're a normal horse. Sometimes they are a horse. Sometimes they are a terrifying, beautiful, really supernatural creature. 
uh, as I said before, Kelpies are definitely on the side of a dangerous creature, possibly even wicked. I don't believe there's lots of encounters of a positive experience with a Kelpie unless they are bridled and tamed, which we can get into. As you saw in Frozen 2, the way Elsa partly tamed the knock was the bridle, and this is very traditional storytelling with water horses. Now either there could be a magical bridle created with a cross on it to tame the Kelpie, or it could be the Kelpie's own bridle. But if you did manage to get a hold of that Kelpie with the bridle, you were possibly able to control it. It is said that a captive Kelpie is supposed to have the strength and stamina of at least 10 horses, if not more, and they can be used to do really draining, draining work that normal horses couldn't do. Uh, silver bullets are also said to kill Kelpie. I hope no one does that. It's even, it's a legend that the McGregor clan actually has a Kelpie's bridle that they have passed down through generations and generations and generations. And it's said this bridle came from an ancestor who took it from a Kelpie in a lock at some point. So once again, the, these creatures are dangerous because their entire point of hunting is they hunt the waterway seducing humans to get on their back. Once the poor unfortunate human is on the horse, they cannot become free and the horse dives back into the lake to drown the human or to simply eat them alive. Either way, it appears that Kelpies don't like entrails as they are often found floating on top of the, of the water or even on the shore, very clearly stating a Kelpie has attacked. Children were very often warned cultural admonitions stay away from waterways and swamps because a Kelpie may spirit them away and trick them into getting eaten, unfortunately. So, in the way that hippocampi are very omnivorous, I would say the kelpies are probably are as well, but definitely have very carnivorous tendencies. They love the human flesh, and that's mostly what they eat. So, that is the kelpie. Well, I hope this has been a fun and informative brief little lecture. Um, I hope this encourages everyone to do their own research on hippocampi and kelpie because there's so much information out there. I'd love to talk about them all day, but this is a quick little lecture just to broaden your horizons. Also, a quick note, if you search either of these creatures online, please add an additional modifier such as creature mythology because you're going to get some very specific results if you don't. If you just search for Kelpie, you're going to get results with the Australian breed of dog. If you put in hippocampus, you're going to get a lot of medical stuff because the hippocampus is the part of the brain mostly associated with memory and when it's removed, it looks like a seahorse. So you're going to get a lot of medical stuff or dog stuff if you don't <laughs> alter your search. Also, if you enjoyed this mini lecture, please, please, please donate to the American River Parkway Foundation. This is one of the charities the Khan has worked with every single year for years and years, and we actually build our clean up around it and of course we can't do that together this year so i'm definitely asking you know for people to donate to the american river parkway foundation there should be a link below somewhere around here we'll have a link to donate and let's make sure we're helping not just the environment in general but that we're keeping our waterways clear for our kelpie and hippocampus friends also nico is very flattered so many of you ask questions about him i was hoping he'd be awake for this he is sleeping. I'll, I'll bring him in. He's he's like a puppy. He's either up or down, up or down. He's sleeping very hard right now. Can you see him? He's covering his eyes because he's very dramatic in the water dip. Um, yeah, this also, this is not a Nico bowl. This is a food bowl. He doesn't care. But yeah, he's sleeping really. Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? Yeah, he's sleeping. And don't get upset. He wakes in the morning all the time. Nico, can you say hi? Nico? No? Can you hear him breathing? No. Okay, he does snore. I'm gonna put him down. So, 
Nico is very excited all of you tuned into this lecture and learned more about the kind of hippocampus he is. But also, if you do love hippocampi and kelp and looking for some great merch out there, one great option is Finfolk Productions. They have the beautiful kelpie tops. If you haven't seen them in person, they're really stunning, they're beautiful. I really like them. They're not available all the time. They're made in small batches, it seems, or special edition colors. So you just have to keep track of those to get a beautiful kelpie top. In terms of our own in-house vendors, Vendors, Merman Garn of Garnet's Grotto has amazing selection of silicone seahorse type uh, products from this cute little thing he's made for me. He's in my colors, little necklace, and actually had a bunch of those made for my Dark Tide Productions team. He can make little ones like that. There's bigger ones. There are leafy sea dragons. There are also full-blown hippocampi that can go on necklaces or armbands and he has a great selection. So please check out our in-house vendor, Garnet Grotto, who has amazing seahorse gear for you to check out. And he's gonna actually have some cool, I think exclusive merch and possibly even sales during the con. So keep an eye out. So once again, thank you so much to the California Mermaid Convention for creating this amazing digital event this year and for in general creating such a wonderful supportive loving community i'm so proud to be a part of this organization that not just supports communities in need but measurably raises funds that really makes a difference and doesn't just talk or post about it and that's why this event is so beloved to me so i hope you all have an amazing day and an amazing weekend continue with all the great fun digital content of the california mermaid convention and i hope i will see all of you next year in person take care bye